Right, um, afternoon everyone and welcome. Uh, as is quite obvious, I think we're going to be talking about the security of fitness tracking devices, i.e. Fitbits and Apple Watches and you know, the smart watches and the cheaper sort of fitness only trackers. Just out of curiosity, can I have a show of hands? Who owns some kind of smartwatch or fitness tracker that they use? Almost all of you, that's, uh, that's interesting. I wonder how many of you will want to keep using it when we've finished. But uh, just briefly on uh, who I am, my name's Jason Halley, as you will have read in the program. I am not Jason Burling, he's presenting on track three. I now take a pause as you all get up and leave because you actually wanted to go to that talk instead. Uh, but <laughs> I digress. Uh, I'm a Bachelor's of Engineering, Cybersecurity Forensic graduate. I've recently completed my degree. Um, during that time, I've, been a, I've acted as a threat research and content intern with uh, a security, uh, a security provider company uh, I won't name. Uh, my dissertation is on fitness tracker security. So yes, this is based on my dissertation work that I've undertaken during my final year. I've recently accepted an offer to join Capgemini as a security analyst. So I'll be joining them sometime in, uh, shortly in the future. And I've, I have been a, a, an NSEC member since second year and I occasionally play CTFs and I'm not completely rubbish. If you've seen me before, then you may remember me from such presentations as comparing cybersecurity to a shrunken ship and attempting to rickroll an audience without first conducting an AV check. I did conduct an AV check this morning. And in terms of anything outside of security, all you really need to know is this. Dancing. I like dancing. I like trains. I cannot watch that without doing the hand gesture. Don't ask me why. But yes, I'm a closet train spotter. Here is me on the footplate of the Flying Scotsman in Carlisle. So getting back to the topic at hand, what are we actually going to talk about? Well, we'll look briefly at some of the um, issues and such that exist when it comes to the security and the privacy of these devices. We'll look at hardware that uh, we're going to use when looking at these, the software that we're going to use. That's quite brief, actually. And then the main, the main meat of potatoes will be the flaws and the impacts uh, that I've discovered in the process of doing my dissertation and the possible defenses that could be do, uh, used to protect yourself against those. So why should you care? Well, medical information isn't a password. You can't change it if it gets breached. You can't change your ECG readout from a particular date and time. Once it's happened, it's happened, and you're never going to be able to change that again. Whereas if your password gets breached, you can quite easily change your password. This is, a, it, it's an enhanced form of personal identifiable information and it's being gathered 24-7, 365, anytime you are wearing your smartwatch or your fitness tracker. Uh, on the right there, you'll see a list of uh, sensors and data points that can be collected by the latest Apple Watch. And at the bottom there, you'll see the list of communication uh, capabilities that it has. So not only Wi-Fi, wi Bluetooth that you'd expect, but also GPS to accurately position yourself anywhere in the world, and also 4G. So even without your phone, uh, a more modern and potentially more expensive smart device like this would be able to continue capturing data and transmitting it. Does anybody recognize what this is? No, it is not. Any advance on it's one of the Afghanistan bases? No. 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 <laughs> no, this is in fact, in, uh, this uh, is in fact a satellite photo from Australia. It's a facility known as Pine Gap, and officially it's run by the Australian Defense Forces. However, a significant number of the people who work there are Americans and is effectively an American signals intelligence facility. But these lines in orange and different shades of red that you can see around the facility, that's actually a heat map from, from an app called Strava, which a lot of people use to track their workout activity when they go running, cycling, whatever it is they choose to do. And in 2017, this heat map was released that clearly showed the border of this facility and its location with uh, American troops who had obviously gone for a run around the border, around the border fence as part of their daily exercise. And this, led, this was because by default, if you had a, an account with Strava, you gave permission to share that data with Strava and they could do what they want with it, including release it publicly. And also by default, there were no private zones that existed in, uh, in Strava, meaning that no matter how close you were to a place of home, place of work, or indeed classified intelligence facilities in the middle of the Australian outback, 
it would continue to track your precise location when you were doing exercise. It was also proved to be very uh, simple um, from this data breach to identify usernames, profile pictures, and if people were tracking it using Strava, potentially their heart rate. And this isn't the only case where this has revealed troop movements. Uh, it's been possible to see buildup of troops on certain islands in the South China Sea by Chinese armed forces based on them showing up in heat maps once they've uh, been stationed at that location. So in addition to poor privacy, Bluetooth is very hard as it turns out because a lot of things use the 2.4 gigahertz radio space to communicate, not only Bluetooth, but Wi-Fi and others. Interference is very common in this frequency range, so it's why you have a situation where Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth will continuously hop between different channels, different uh, sub-frequencies effectively, to avoid this interference and keep a stable connection. That diagram you can see there is the is uh, the likelihood of any particular channel being selected. It's uh, called a channel switching algorithm. There's also been recent controversy with some of the companies that manufacture these devices. So cheaper devices from Xiao, uh, Huawei, Xiaomi, and other companies that you may or may not have heard of before um, were considerably in it less expensive than devices from the more known uh, manufacturers like, say, Apple or Fitbit. And when the Apple and Fitbit devices sold out, people turned to devices like uh, from the likes of Xiaomi, who sold 13.4 million units in just one quarter of 2020 of one of their devices, the Xiaomi Mi Band 5. Of course, Huawei has been banned from the UK's 5G network because of the accusations that they've been spying on users and spying on behalf of the Chinese state, which has put a distrust in a lot of these brands, despite the fact that there is, as of yet, no evidence that any of the devices sold, at least to individuals, have actually been used to compromise it uh, or used uh, in spying. Actually, one moment. It's definitely not a security bottle, honest. So let's go on and have a look at the hardware. So what we're hacking and with what we're gonna hack it. So these are the two main items of Bluetooth uh, hardware. As mentioned before, the Xiaomi Mi Band 5, which is a very inexpensive device, costs generally between 20 and 30 pounds, depending what voucher code is available on Amazon. As I say, it's extremely popular. They sold over 13 million units just in one quarter of 2020. And it has some of the more common uh, sensors and measuring uh, capability that you'll find on most of these devices, i.e. an accelerometer, gyroscope, and heart rate measurement. You don't send, tend to find many of the especially cheaper devices that can carry out an ECG. Uh, and on the right there is a passive Bluetooth capture device called the Adafruit Bluefruit LE Friend, henceforth to be called the Bluefruit because I don't want to say that long name. Uh, that's a more pa that's a, a passive capture device, so it doesn't actively transmit data, or at least it doesn't in the way it's been programmed. Um, it's made to debug uh, Bluetooth implementations and mainly feeds uh, packets into a packet capture software like Wireshark. And that just uses a standard Bluetooth radio. It's the firmware that actually it fitted, um, it's the firmware that that device comes with that enables the functionality rather than the, any special sort of really specialized hardware. Except for the fact that for some reason, the um, controller on the device expects a, uh, a COM port on your computer. And I don't have a computer from the 20th century. So in that case, you end up having to set it up a little bit something like this, a virtual driver feeding into Python, which then goes through Nordic Semiconductor's plugin and into Wireshark. The other hardware I'm going to be using, or I have used, is a Huawei P10, which will act as the attacking device. In reality, you could use really any Android smartphone. And an iPhone 12, which I installed the Mi Fit app onto to connect to the uh, Xiaomi Mi Band 5 itself. Now, I had some great crazy justification about why I chose these devices in my uh, original dissertation. But as this is a bit more of a casual setting, I can admit, I chose these devices because I already owned them, and I'm a broke student, and I don't want to go out and buy smartphones all the time. So the software, this one's quite brief. There's three main pieces of software we're using. Wireshark, I would presume most people here have heard of, open source packet capture software only used for capturing network traffic, but can be used for capturing other kinds of traffic, including Bluetooth, if you have the right plugin and the right hardware. Uh, an app called NRF Connect from Nordic Semiconductor running on Android. So that enables you to scan for Bluetooth devices, uh, investigate their functionality, and in some cases, write values to them uh, in a way that 
the, it knows the format of the expected value, so you can, it makes it much easier to write values than some other programs. Uh, and an app called BT Inspector from George Gar's side, that's on the iOS side, that can be used for similar sorts of activities, but it doesn't let you pre-format the value you want to write. So, science in it. We don't really know it, but we're gonna try it anyway, as Tom Scott once said. So let's move on to what we actually tried. So, this is an unpaired advertising packet. So this is the, when you turn the fitness tracker on, and, excuse me, when you turn the fitness tracker on and it's not connected to anything, this is the type of packet it will continually transmit, and it will get, transmit over and over and over again, for as long as you let it, really. Uh, and I've picked out some of the more relevant, more important things. Uh, one of which being the channel selection algorithm, which is number two. Uh, the number one algorithm was considered weaker and easier to predict what channel the device would switch to, which wouldn't be ideal if you were able to predict that. Um, the public Bluetooth address, so this device tells everyone what its address is, even those who wouldn't need to know it. So this way you can you now uniquely identify the device because that address is set in hardware and can't easily be changed, at least normally. We'll get back to that near the end. There's also a list of Bluetooth low energy and BREDR compatibility modes. BREDR effectively just means normal Bluetooth. That's base rate and enhanced data rate, but it effectively just means normal Bluetooth. Uh, about whether which device can act as a host and a controller. Uh, and then at the bottom, you have the OEM details, which is Anhui Huami Information Technology Company Limited, which I thought was quite strange because I was told I was buying a Xiaomi device, not an Anhui Huami Information Technology Company Limited device. But a quick look on FCC later, or on the FCC website, finds a, you find a filing for a device from that company called the Amazfit Band 5. So it turns out that a lot of these cheaper devices, they're just rebranded among companies and sold under many different brands such as Amazfit or Xiaomi or whatever. So that's great. We can uniquely identify the device. Actually, it's not so great if you're the one using the device. But of course, it's, it's not like we can, uh, we can determine signal strength from this. Oh wait, yes we can. But it's, it's definitely only one application that can, uh, can read this, right? So there's, it's not very popular, right? Nope, you can read signal strength in any number of applications, both in scientific figures and just random percentages, making it very easy to track a device similar to how uh, agents during World War II behind enemy lines would be located through an examining signal strength and direction. And in fact, um, in my dissertation, I write about an experiment I did where I had someone place this fitness tracker randomly in the, um, in the student halls that I lived in. And I was able to find it about half the time it would take me to manually search all the rooms. Here is an obligatory meme. My GPS is off, how is you tracking me? Because your watch is broadcasting your location to everyone. And of course, if you have more than one person using any sort of these applications, you could simply have three people carry out a triangulation and locate the uh, individual relatively easily. So that's not great, but of course none of that involves actually connecting to the device. So what if I'm able to connect to the device? Uh, well, before I cover that, I just wanna briefly I explain this uh, hierarchy here. So the, in a lot of these apps, uh, different values you see are broken down First of all, by profile, a set of predefined services. So for example, there's a heart rate profile, which isn't actually programmed into the fitness tracker itself, but it's a standard that lists a predefined set of services that would need to be included, or some of them can be optional, if you wanted to carry out that function. Obviously, there's, there's profiles for other things like glucose monitoring and, and different things like this. The service is just a logical group of data and the characteristic is a single data point, so heart rate measurement would in itself be a single data point. Now to get any of this though, I would need to be able to de-auth the user, effectively cause their smartphone to disconnect from the fitness tracker, or carry out some sort of denial of service. Now if this can be done, or you can get at them during the pairing process, then a stealth connection, as I've called it here, is possible, because if you're pairing using the MeFit app, the fitness tracker will vibrate and flash up a little confirmation screen where you have to press the tick before the devices will pair. If you attempt to pair through an app like, say, NRF Connect, 
it doesn't put up this confirmation, it just pairs. So if you were able to deauth the user from their fitness tracker, you could then connect to it without the user becoming aware of it, which is far from ideal. And sure enough, under heart rate, under the heart rate service, there is a characteristic called heart rate measurement, and that value can be read from the device, and apparently my heart rate was quite high, or a little bit above resting uh, when I read this. It was 80 beats per minute. And indeed, I found this uh, value, which can both be read and written to, the new alert value. And as I was saying about NRF Connect, it understands the expected format of this value, i.e. the name of the type of notification, a call, the number of them, one, and the message, which would generally be the number or the contact who is calling you, which I include as NUSEC. And when you write this uh, to the fitness tracker, to the Xiaomi Mi Band, it starts vibrating on your wrist, informing you that NUSEC is calling you. And a couple of you will recognize this picture because I posted this on my Twitter on April Fool's Day, which may not have been the best idea I ever had. But uh, I did have to decide to have a little bit of a caption competition to ask, why is Elliot, our president of, current president of NUSEC, calling me? Now, I, 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 there, weren't that many, there weren't that many entries have been, if I'm being honest, but uh, I did offer a prize, although I didn't reveal what it was until today. It is, in fact, this miniature of Glenfiddich single malt scotch. And after conferring with a third party and agree which was the funniest reply, we concluded that the winner is, drum roll please, Does my bum look big in this from Tia? Is Tia here? Can I? Yes, I think her talk might have overrun. Well, well done to Tia, and I'll make sure that she gets this before the end of the day, before we hit the pub. Sorry, Dominic. D Dominic was the first to send in a reply on the basis that no one else would and that he would win by default. He was unsuccessful in this because I tried to drum up more support on social media. Sorry. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. So I mentioned that in order to connect to the person's uh, tracker via stealth, you'll need to carry out some sort of deal thing or potentially denial of service attack. So one of the experiments I carried out was to test whether a denial of service attack was possible. And the attack that I was using was effectively uh, what could be referred to as a ping of death, the idea being to flood the device with so many ping requests that either I take up all the transmission time with it replying to my ping request and it can't transmit back to where it's supposed to, or I overwhelm the processor and the software crashes. Uh, the tool I used to do that was L2Ping. It's part of a package called Blues uh, that you should be able to get on most Linux distros, although I'm using Kali Linux here because, well, because Kali Linux and I'm a hacker, so it kind of comes with a card. Um, and discovered that 668 bytes, not 669 unfortunately, is the maximum uh, ping message length that you can send. If you send any longer, then you get an error that you can see at the bottom there reading, send failed, message too long. The arguments in that are quite simple. It's the message length, the number of me ping messages you want to send, and the Bluetooth address that you want to send it to, which we established in the first experiment that we were able to find that. So the way I tested this, and it looked very weird at the time, was to walk for 15 minutes around, in a, well, in a circle, more in a rectangle, around the, um, the Jack Hilby Computing Center at Merkiston Campus with a fitness tracker on my, on my wrist, tracking, live tracking a walking workout to my phone in my pocket, carrying my laptop, which is spamming ping packets continuously in a loop. And yes, I did physical exercise. I was surprised as well. And this was the outcome of that exercise after I completed it. As you can see, there's not really any gap, there's no gap in this heart rate tracking and no sort of vertical jump at any point, which um, I concluded in, uh, was, um, excuse me, <coughs> I concluded that this denial of service wasn't successful because we weren't able to interrupt that normal transmission of this data from the fitness tracker back to the phone. So then we moved on, oh, then I moved on rather, and tried passive capturing. So effectively, rather than uh, interfering with the device, simply to read that data that's going between it and the phone and see what you can get from it. Now, what I'd found was that the Bluetooth tracker itself continues to advertise that it exists in a broadcast packet that you can see at the bottom there to everything 
even when it is connected to a smartphone. It simply advertises the fact that it can't connect to anything else. So it's saying, look at me, I'm here, but you can't connect to me. Which, of course, makes tracking even easier, because even when the person's using the device, you would still be able to, re to use these broadcast packets, if nothing else, to successfully track it. Uh, but these were all the Adafruit was capturing, which shouldn't be how the Adafruit functions. Um, from reading other people's dissertations, they've been able to use this to successfully capture data packets, even if they were encrypted. Obviously, they wouldn't make any sense unless you were able to decrypt them, but it wasn't capturing anything other than these advertising packets, which was strange, but it was okay. I had a backup method. My backup method was to use HCI logging. So that's a host controller interface log, which is a function in uh, the developer settings of most Android phones where you can effectively say, log all the Bluetooth traffic packets that are sent to or from this device. Trades a little log file, you pull that out to your computer, open it in Wireshark, and you can analyze it however you wish. As I said, that can be turned on the developer settings, or you can turn it on the Android debugging shell, which is great, except for the fact that on some manufacturers' implementation of Android, it simply doesn't work, it won't even if you manually set the value to true in the ADB shell, you'll find that when you read out the file again, it says that it's set to false, and it won't create a log file, which is far from ideal. You can see that just here. So th th this is me attempting to, um, this is me catting the uh, contents of the Bluetooth configuration file. And uh, does this sound a laser? It does, yeah. So. You can see the BT snoop log output, basically whether I'm going to log the output of my Bluetooth traffic, is set to false, despite the fact that I set it to true. And also this BT snoop file name, this log file that's supposed to exist, doesn't exist anywhere in the file system because there's no point creating it because it would just be an empty file. So at this point, I felt kind of like this. That hadn't gone well at all, as Clarkson might say. But we'd still discovered some things that uh, were, could be cause for concern and that actions could be taken to, def to defend against. So that's what I'm going to look at. Like, finally, the defenses. I see how we're doing time-wise. We're okay. Right. So one of the defenses is address cycling. So a lot of the attacks, as you may have seen, rely on knowing the unique uh, Bluetooth address of the device you wish to attack. If that changes, such as, say, in Windows, where you're able to have uh, MAC address changing every time you connect to a network, if you're able to do that for your Bluetooth devices, this would confuse attackers and prevent long-term attacks, because you may hard code one uh, address into your attack, only to find that by the time you run that attack, the address of the device has changed and you're unable to, you're unable to um, continue your attack because that address is no longer valid. I had a look to see if anyone already did this, and it turns out Apple actually already does this. If you look in their uh, security information for watchOS, they tell you that the device address is rotated at 15 minute intervals, which is good, and they even mention it reduces the risk of the device being locally tracked if it broadcasts a persistent identifier. Literally the problem we were trying to solve from address cycling. Good on Apple for doing something good instead of responding to bogus requests from fake law enforcement looking for data, as was announced a couple days ago. I suppose you win some, you lose some. Anyway, so what else can we do potentially about tracking? Well, if a Bluetooth device is only supposed to talk to one device, instead of having it constantly broadcast to everything else, I exist, but you can't interact with me, just don't do that. Only transmit when you need to. If you reduce the amount of transmissions you're making to only those which are necessary for the functionality, i.e. those between the device and the phone that it's already paired to, then it doesn't leave nothing for the hacker to track, as I've said here, but at least significantly less for a hacker to track uh, and makes it considerably more difficult then to exploit that in any sort of way. So th these are the three, three takeaways that I think are the most important anyway. Uh, you might think differently, but uh, Bluetooth is easy and hard at the same time because you could troll someone or attack their Bluetooth fitness tracker using nothing but the phone that we almost all have in our pockets. But yet, reliably capturing Bluetooth packets could be so difficult that oftentimes you'd have to resort to a device which captures the entirety of the 2.4 gigahertz radio space 
which would cost you several thousand dollars, and I can't afford one of those because I'm a broke student, at least, and now I am. Uh, users need to be more aware of what's being gathered and who can view it. So a lot of, not a lot of, um, of uh, ordinary users, for want of a better word, would have a threat model and probably wouldn't factor in uh, any additional risk that having you know, a heart rate monitor, an ECG, a notification engine on their wrist 24-7 would do. And they probably haven't considered uh, whether they, uh, they, are accept, they accept that kind of data gathering the same way that a lot of people uh, have used Facebook for so long that they, know, they sort of know that Facebook's gathering a lot of data on them, but they don't know, they don't investigate it specifically, and they, even no matter what they seem to know about it, they don't attempt to stop uh, using Facebook or control their data in any sort of way. And the final one there is that most of these issues can't really be fixed by the user. It's annoying because a lot of them relate to just the way the Bluetooth standard or the way these devices that run proprietary code have been programmed. And so what, you really ha what uh, we really need is for the people designing, manufacturing these devices and standardization uh, organizations, so the people who are creating things for standards like Bluetooth, Bluetooth Low Energy, they need to make these changes or force organizations to make these changes because they're not a thing users can do for us, can generally do for themselves, but the companies that make these devices aren't, going, aren't likely to change them unless they're forced to because why would they? They can just leave it the same way and continue to make a crap load of money selling 13 million units in one quarter. So um, that's it for me. Thank you very much for, for coming and not for running away when I gave you the opportunity to go to track three instead. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you've learned something. Thank you to NUSEC for inviting me to give this presentation today. And uh, if we have time, I'll be willing to take any questions. Thanks. Do we have any questions? Oh, there's one. Hold on. I'll see if I can throw the cube. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Shout your question then. Um, so just for the recording there, um, you asked whether consumers can better, how consumers could audit um, devices that they're looking at purchasing before they decide to buy them. That, that's, that's quite difficult due to the nature of proprietary code, et cetera, and the issues that even technical people can have in trying to capture data from these things. The best thing would just be to, I, I would guess, Google, Google the device name with you know, keywords like vulnerability or flaw, have a look and see if anything's been discovered by security researchers and published, or uh, even just look at the specifications on the manufacturer's website and look at what are they set, what do they purport to do to keep the device secure. Like Apple publicly states that their devices rotate Bluetooth addresses every 15 minutes. I, at least in my research, didn't find anyone else who did the same thing. Anyone else have a question? Seeing and hearing none. Guess that means I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>